Okay, everyone. Uh, one last topic, graph theory. I'll kind of decide as I go on this one whether I break it up into two uh, videos or one. It's on uh, chapter 14 from our textbook, uh, graph theory. And the idea of a graph is to organize and show relationships and get rid of, omit all useless information. Okay, so that's my own definition, but I think it works pretty well. And uh, so the, the author gives a nice example, and here's the example. You've got some preschool class with uh, 10 children in it, I think. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I labeled them, I changed the names, uh, put them all A through J, okay, using as short of names as I could. So uh, this teacher watches all these children and notices who the child plays with, okay? So Ann plays with no one. Bob plays with C, D, E, F, I. So C, D, E, F, and I. Cal plays with B, D, E, and F. Uh, Dan plays with uh, Bob, Carl, and Ike. And Aaron plays with, with Bob, Carl, and Fred. And you can see all the rest down there. So there's a bunch of information. And it's, it's kind of difficult to get a full sense of the relationships there of of the children and what they're playing just by looking at these bunch of of uh letters and so much better way to organize it and this is the genius of graph theory is to uh forget about the age of the child the full name of the child uh exactly how they interacted and all that kind of stuff instead just the question is do you play with them if so you put a line between those two so here's bob bob played with uh all uh, five, everyone, every, oh, uh, all, uh, I shouldn't say all five because there's some over here as well. This is G right here. Uh, Bob uh, played with those five and Carl played with one, two, three, four and Ike played with those two. Fred played with those three. Here's Ann all by herself, played with no one. And here's uh, these three here. Uh, Hal plays with uh, Gus, and Gus plays obviously then plays with Hal, and Gus also plays with Joe and back and forth. Okay, <coughs> so um, so there's a graph that that shows things, and as again as the author pointed out, once you have that, you can kind of see, oh wow, uh, what can I do to help uh, Ann maybe play with some more students, and is it is it uh, you know good good for Bob, very gregarious person, uh, you know gets a star. Um, you know, what, uh, is there a way to connect these with these? I mean, all sorts of things. Once you have the graph that you can start asking some questions. So anyway, back to graph theory here. Let me throw some words at you. I'm not going to, this uh, chapter 14 has just lots and lots of terms. I'm going to keep them to a minimum because as an introduction to graph theory, you, you don't want to spend your time just memorizing a whole bunch of terms. Instead, I want to give you the ones that you need in order to understand what I'm saying. But other than that, kind of leave it. So anyway, uh, each one of these corners is called a vertice, okay, a, or a vertex, actually. Each one is called a vertex, um, and the plural is vertice, vertice, vertice. Ah, oh, boy, um, let me spell it right, vertices, vertices, there you go, okay? There's more than one, so those are all vertices. Each one of these corners uh, is a vertice. Each one of these things is an edge, okay? They, whoever came up with these chose, you know, pretty reasonable words. Um, the, the, um, the degree, excuse me, <coughs> the degree of a vertex is just the number of edges that come together. So the degree of I is two, the degree of B is one, two, three, four, five. The degree of C is three and so on. So that's the degree of the vertex. And one of the very first uh, theorems that uh, the author points out is that if you add up all the, de all the uh, degrees, here's a mathematical symbol for, for to sum up. You sum up all the, the degrees uh, how, how many are there? There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Let's see. Let me do that again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 
11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. What am I missing? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There it is. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So the total sum of all the degrees is 24. And if we count up the total number of edges, what are we going to get? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's 12 edges. And notice that there's twice, if you sum up all the degrees of the vertices, that's twice as large of a number as the edges. Does that make sense? Uh, sure, the author spends a whole paragraph explaining it, but it's really easy because every, every edge that you draw has to begin and end at a certain vertex. And so it's going to add one to the degree of this one, and it's going to add one to the degree of that one. So, uh, so it's uh, clear that uh, every edge gives you two more two more um, uh, to, the, to the total sum of the degrees. Okay, let's see what else I want to say. Edges, degrees. Oh, okay. A, if, if, if this was the only graph right here, I didn't, if I didn't have this stuff, if I just had this, that would be said to be a connected graph. And the reason that would be connected is because from every vertex, I can get to every other vertex. Okay, that's if this were the whole thing. It'd be connected. Given the fact that the graph includes this as well, we say that the graph is disconnected, okay? Because you can't get from here to here, okay? There's no way to get from there to there, so it's disconnected. If it is disconnected, then each one of these connected portions is called a component, okay? So again, these, these are words that are just kind of good to know, connected, disconnected, and component, okay? Again, kind of natural words to use. So you have three components to this particular graph. Okay, uh, the un only other thing I want to mention is um, I, I drew this ahead of time. Um, I could have I could have drawn it like this. Here's my I and B and F and C and D. Uh, let, let me just put them around in a circle like this. And I'm, I'm not going to take time to do it, but it might be that I would have gotten something you know, something like this instead, and they all crossed and so on. And, and as, long as, as long as basically if you can take this one and just kind of move it like you're on one of those games where you can just kind of take it and, and move it like on one of the map features where you just take it and you want to move your route. And if you can shift this over to this, these are said to be isomorphic, okay? So as long as they have all the same information, isomorphic, isomorphic. Iso means the same as, okay? So, and morph, morphic, metamorphosis, uh, is the form. So basically it's the same form. So even though they look different, they give you all the same information. Anything you would learn from this one, you'd learn exactly the same thing from this one. So they're isomorphic, okay? All you've done is, if I were to just to take this and, and move it in here closer, well, what's the big deal, okay? It's still isomorphic. If I were to take it and move it here instead, okay, still isomorphic, okay? Because it's all the same information. So you don't want the way, the, the way you happen to draw it, you don't want that to, to be important, okay? What's important is these relationships of the edges going from vertex to vertex. Okay, so I think those are all the words that are used by the author in the first, uh, first few pages. Here's one more word, okay? I'm gonna get rid of these now. If you take just a portion of this graph, and I'm gonna take just this portion here, B, C, F, and E, And connect them okay that's that's what you have right there this is called a subgraph the author doesn't use this term by the way but you, a portion of a graph is called a subgraph <coughs> notice that this particular subgraph 
has the property that every single vertex is connected directly to every other vertex. See that? B goes to all three of the other ones, so does C, so does F, so does E. Whenever you have a graph where every single vertex is connected to every other, it's said to be complete. Basically, to be complete means you can't add any more edges. Right here I could add an edge, a direct edge that went from, from D to F. Right now there's no connection from D to F. Or I could go from C to A. Okay, there are lots of them. But uh, here, there's nothing more, this portion right here, there's nothing more to add. Everything, every, every, there's exactly one edge. I should say exactly one edge. You could put, sometimes you, you have, might have two edges that go from one vertex to another. But a complete graph is that there's exactly one edge from every vertex to every other vertex that's said to be complete. Okay? If you have a complete graph, then how many, um, how many, uh, edges will will there be to it and so on let's let's think about it here let's uh let's take an example which is maybe a little bit easier to see there's one with with six vertices and so if i connect everything here and now i want to make all these connections and now i want to make all these connections now I want to make these connections, and do I have them all? Uh, let's see, I'm missing from here to here. Okay, well let's think about it. You have six vertices, right? Every vertice is going to have what for a degree? The degree of each one, since every one is going to, to every other vertex, the degree of each is going to be 5, right? Because this goes to all the other 5. So the degree of each is going to be 5. So you have 6 of them, and each of them have degree 5. And so uh, there's going to be a total. Uh, the, the sum of all the degrees is going to be 6 times 5, which is equal to 30. Okay? And what did we say was the relationship between vertices or between the, the sum of the degrees and the edges, every, every edge has, adds to two, adds, adds two to the sum, and so that means that uh, there's gonna be 30 divided by two, the number of edges equals 15 edges. Okay, I could count them up. Okay, but uh, believe me, okay? One, two, Oops, there's got to be five, so I'm missing one here. One, two, three. Oh, no, that's five. Everyone has five. Yep, very good. Okay, so that's a complete graph. Okay, finally, what if I... There's all sorts of neat stuff in this chapter. What if we were to take... Um, and do this. What if we were to take each vertex and say, okay, I'm going to color this one black. It's already black. And any other vertex that it's connected to, I want to make it a different color. Because anything that it's connected to, I want it to be a different color. So for example, this one is black. This and this are connected. So I'm going to make this one red. Okay? This and this are connected, uh, so, or, or wait, let me, let me go from here to here. Uh, this and this are connected, so I can make uh, this one red. Um, and I think that's about it, because I have to do the same thing with the other vertices as well. Look, look at from, from here to here. I can't make this one red, because it can't be the same as this, because this is connected. It's also connected to this one, so I can call that one green. And this one over here is not connected to this one, so I can call that one green. See that? And now, finally, I think I only need one more color and can call this one uh, blue. See that? So basically, the, the rule is that if two vertices are connected by an edge, 
then those vertices have to have different colors. And that's what's called coloring a graph. Coloring a graph. Okay, coloring a graph two vertices connected by an edge have different colors. Okay? And so that's called a colored graph. Um, what, why, why would you ever want to do this? What would be the point of this? And I, I, it took me a while, but I thought of a kind of a nice example using these kids. What if all these kids, uh, and, and, and let's just forget about this, this part for now. Let's just talk about this one. In fact, I'll get rid of this. Let's just talk about this portion right here. Um, so um, so um, why, why, would I, why would I be interested in, um, in coloring a graph this way? So um, maybe, maybe um, the easiest example of where this would be used is if you go right back to the classroom and you say, suppose that each of these child, children is given a color of paint and uh, Bob will paint with Dan, and Bob will paint with Fred. Uh, Carl won't paint with Ike. If you paint with the other, with the other child, then you have an edge that goes from one to the other. So the edges indicate who you're gonna end up uh, painting with. And given that these are who you're gonna be painting with, the teacher wants to make it clear that once you paint with someone that you have two colors between the two of you so that you can make, make a, a, a two-colored two uh, picture, okay? So the question is, how many different colors, does, given that this is the way in which they're going to be painting with each other, uh, this is the organization and the relationship, how many different colors of paint does the teacher need to buy? And here the answer would be four, because, uh, because as long as um, you have four different colors there, every single person, when they're, no matter who they're painting with, they're, they're always going to have two colors. So, uh, so there's an example of where you'd have colored graphs, coloring a graph. Uh, something to notice here is that just this portion right here, even without this, requires four colors. Okay? Remember, note, recall that this is a complete graph. Complete graph is where there's an edge from every point to every other, uh, from every vertex to every other vertex. So right here, if this one's black, let's let this one be blue, and this one be green. Ah, sorry. This one be green. And this one be red. Okay, so when you have a complete graph, one where every, every, um, vertex is connected to every other, then uh, this particular one uh, needs four, four colors to, to color. Uh, what if you had threw in a, a fifth vertex yet, and you still, and this one was connected to all the others. If this is connected to everything, if it's connected here, if it's connected there, if it's connected there, and if it's connected there, okay, so now, everyone is connected to, to uh, four of them, okay? Then you'd need five colors, okay, for this particular graph, right? Because this one is connected to all the others. So it couldn't be black, it couldn't be any of these. Uh, let's call this one uh, orange. I'll just call it orange, okay? But notice that in order to draw a graph which requires five colors to, um, to color it, I needed to cross one edge with the other. See that? There's no vertex there. I just needed to cross it. Okay, if, if, you, if you think of this as existing not in a plane, but in space, then you could think of this edge right here being up above the other one. This one here lies below, this one up above. So they don't actually touch because one lies above. But in that case, they all don't lie in a plane. If they all lie in a plane, then they're crossing. So, so this graph right here is said to be a planar graph because everything lies in the plane. As soon as you have something, a graph that looks like this, then, then since there's no vertex there, what you're really assuming is that one is kind of up over the other one and so it doesn't, not in a plane. 
So uh, anyway, the point is, in order to have uh, five colors needed, we had to go to a non-planar graph. And this is connected, this is connected to a very similar idea having to do with uh, coloring a map. If you have a map where you have uh, countries, say maybe it looks like this, and um, here's your different countries, maybe that look like this, and you, you, if you color a map, you want to make sure that any country that ne is next to another one don't have the same color because you want to make it clear uh, what, um, what belongs to what country or not. So since this is black, these can't be black. This just touches at a point, so I can color that one black okay. Uh, but that touches uh, all of these, so none of these can be black. I'm going to need another color for here, I can co color this one green, see that? And I can also color uh, this one green, uh, they don't touch. And then I can color um, uh, these two uh, red, for example, see that? So this particular map uh, would need, what, three different colors, red, green, and black, in order to color the whole thing clearly so that it's clear exactly what the boundaries of the countries are. Okay, so that one required three. What would be one that would require four? Okay, what would require four? Uh, let's see if I can think of one. What if we have something like, like this? Um, but that would we need to color this one? Well, let's see. We can color the center black, and then we can color the top of it blue. and one side red, and another side green. See that? So there's a, a map which requires four colors to uh, differentiate each region from, from, the, from the other. And notice how similar this map is to this configuration right there, or this complete graph, right? It's kind of the same idea there. If, uh, if one region touches the other, you can think of there being an edge from one to the other. So you see the connection between maps and graphs. So anyway, here's one that requires four colors. Can you come up with a map which requires uh, more than four colors? Okay, uh, um, can you find a, a map that uh, in order to color it so that no country touches, uh, has a boundary, not just a corner, it's okay to have a corner, uh, that's that's fine. This this one can be the same as this color because they just share a corner together, but uh, they can't have a boundary. Then can you come up with one that requires five? And mathematicians tried for the longest time to uh, come up with one, and they couldn't. And then they tried to prove that you only need four colors, and they couldn't do that either. And so it was an outstanding problem for a number of years called the four... Uh, color map uh, problem or theorem and finally I think it was in 1976 if I'm not mistaken that uh, several mathematicians or computer scientists actually uh, gave a proof and the way they proved it was not by some sort of an elegant method such as we prove that there's an infinite number of primes where you come up with this beautiful argument and you can't disagree with each step of the argument and so you have to take the conclusion and, and uh, you're, you're convinced Instead, they basically broke this thing up into just a huge, huge number of cases, and they had a computer look at all these possible cases. And it took, I can't remember what it was, but it was hours and hours of computer time in order to look at all these cases. And in doing it, they solved the problem. They showed that it was not possible. And they were expecting a standing ovation at the end of this talk because they had solved the problem which had been uh, frustrating and confounding mathematicians for years and years and instead as I understand the situation there was just silence and there was silence because people thought they had been cheated okay now they knew the answer but there was not an, any sort of an elegant uh, proof of it anything that they could all look at and say oh yeah now we see now we see not only that it's true but we see why it's true that you will only always need just only four colors Instead, all they had was these pages and pages of computer code uh, with the final conclusion that, yeah, we've checked everything. So uh, mathematicians like 
problems and proofs that are not only give the answer but also have a certain beauty to them. And uh, the, the mathematician Paul Erdős, probably the most uh, famous mathematician of the of the 20th century. Every mathematician who lives now has an Erdős number, just like the Kevin Bacon number, which is actually something else to do with graphs that's talked about in the book. Every mathematician has a Erdős number. With Kevin Bacon, if you start, if you were in a film together with Bacon, then you were Erd uh, Bacon number one. If you starred in a or not starred, but acted in a movie with someone who acted with Bacon, then you were uh, Bacon number two. And same thing with Erdős. If you published a paper with Erdős, you were Erdős number one. If you published a paper with someone who published a paper with Erdős, you're Erdős number two, and so on. So everyone has has an Erdős number. So anyway, uh, that's that's Paul Erdős. He had he was a really interesting guy. He was a very colorful personality, and uh, he in particular said his 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 great um, compliment that he could give anyone is to say that's a theorem from the book, which means that's a theorem that is so beautiful that only only as it were God could have uh, come up with that that proof, and it's from the the, the big uh, divine book. And uh, so anyway, the the book, the the theorem of these uh, uh, scholars who proved the four color map problem. Um, was not from the book, okay? It was anything but. It was it was on a piece of old newspaper print, wadded up and torn. It was not at all pretty. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, some interesting history there. So very good. So I think this is probably long enough. And so in the last lecture, uh, we will look at several other things that can be done with graphs. Very good.